Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. Welcome to this week's episode of People First. And my guest this week is Dr. Vanessa Patrick, who is the author of this outstanding book. Outstanding, because look at the number, and I'm only a third of the way through it, of flags. Outstanding book, The Power of Saying No, The New Science of How to Say No That Puts You in Charge of Your Life. And as I started the book, it resonated for me in so many ways, personally, because I do have a habit of saying yes when I know I should say no, but in that it connects with our research for the ally mindset, especially around abundance and generosity and how we can set boundaries for ourselves and communicate them in a way that helps us to be better together with our colleagues. Vanessa is the Associate Dean for Research, Executive Director of Doctoral Programs, a Bauer Professor of Marketing and Lead Faculty of the Executive Women in Leadership Program at the Bauer School of Business at the University of Houston. She's been recognized with a number of awards for both scholarship and teaching, including the Leroy and Lucille Melcher Faculty Excellence Award from the Bauer College of Business for Research Excellence along with many others. She is a regular speaker at both academic and practitioner conferences, including the Association of Consumer Research Conference, the Society for Consumer Psychology Conference, and the Greater Houston Women's Chamber of Commerce annual event. She's a prominent scholar in her field, serves on editorial and policy boards of leading academic journals, and is currently the associate editor for the Journal of Marketing Research and the Journal of Marketing. Vanessa, welcome to People First. Thank you so much, Morag. I'm so excited to be here. Okay. Well, I was interested in your bio because I actually paraphrased it. So for our audience, I was thinking as I was reading through that, wow, so do you embody the hell yes? And all of those things are hell yes. But I also recognize they're things that you have done over decades of research and professional experience. So as with every episode, I'm actually going to take you back to the pre-professional experience time when you were a wee girl. What did you want to be when you grew up? I grew up as the eldest grandchild in a family of doctors. And so it was kind of expected of me that I would become a doctor, a medical doctor. <laughs> and that's pretty much what I grew up thinking I would be till I decided I wasn't going to be that. And that was probably my first empowered no, to say no to my family, that that is not the path that I want to take. And so I'm going to come back to that phrase, empowered no. So what was the pivot point then that made you realize that you didn't want to be a medical doctor, but that you wanted to do something else instead? I think I know. I've, one of the things that is, I, is one of my strengths is self-awareness and a deep sense of knowledge about who I am and what I care about and what I like and what I don't like. And I think giving voice to that has been something that I've been very, very comfortable doing and very intentional about doing. And I think mm -hmm. it started when I was much younger, understanding kind of what I liked and what I didn't like. And I, I've realized that I can be good at something, but I might not enjoy it. And to dis distinguish between being good at something and not enjoying it or enjoying it and recognizing that and saying, hey, I might be good at it, but I don't have to do it for my whole life, which is what happened with the science track. Was very good at it, uh, excelled in every class, top of the university. And the expectation was always, hey, this is what she's going to do. And I know myself and the kind of person that I am. And so I stepped away from that, much to the dismay of my family who thought that I was just going to carry on the family tradition. So you talked there about what bring, essentially what brings you joy in what you do. So yes. what is it then about the work that you do today then that fills you up versus the idea of the medical career that may drain you? Yes. I am so motivated by learning and knowledge 
I think my purpose really centers around knowledge. So if you read my bio, as you just did, you'll see that every facet of it links to knowledge. I spend a lot of time creating new knowledge with my research. I spend a lot of time teaching, doing workshops, and sharing the knowledge that I have with others, which I think is very central to who I am as a person. And I spend a ton of time reading and learning and talking to people to understand the things I don't understand yet. And so mm. everything that I do is looked at through the lens of knowledge. And it's not only work related, it's pretty much anything. So let me give you an example. Uh, I have a 13 year old daughter. And when, the when her teacher asked for volunteers, I use my knowledge lens, my, my, my knowledge is purpose lens to decide what are the things I'm going to do. If it's something that's not related to what I can uniquely bring to the table, I'm less likely to do it. But if I can use my knowledge in a way that's actionable, uh, even if it is for a bunch of 13 year olds, that's the path I will choose, even if it is more difficult, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. And it's one of the sections actually that I highlighted early in your book, in your introduction, where you talk about your life today being centered around knowledge, that you create knowledge with your research, you share knowledge via teaching and writing, and you acquire knowledge from reading extensively and investing in learning from the experiences of others. And that resonated for me because last week I actually took the, the role of learner for the first time in a little while. And I was investing in my own skill development around systematic team coaching. And so that whole idea of creating, sharing and acquiring and it being a virtuous circle really resonated for me as I started to dive into this piece of work. Mm -hmm. Now, you used the phrase earlier on, empowered an empowered no and an empowered refusal. What does that mean? So empowered refusal is the kernel of this book. Uh, so if we backtrack a little bit, we're gonna, we, we clearly recognize that saying no is hard. You talked about this. This is a common situation. People think that saying no is a really hard a word to say. And it's largely because we care about our relationships with other people and how we come across to other people. And the way we've never learned how to say no well. And so we kind of do a clumsy job of it. Empowered refusal is a way of saying no that stems from your identity. So it requires you to develop a certain set of competencies to recognize that there is a way of saying no that is if more effective than other ways of saying no. And so empowered refusal requires us to look inwards, to, to, to ground our no, our refusal, in who we are, what we care about, what we stand for, what we believe. When we do that, we, we, our no's are not rejections of other people. Our no's are giving voice to who we are. And when we give voice to who we are and comes from an authentic and real place, we come across as much more effective. And our no is taken in a much better way. You get less pushback. You get much more compliance. What I liked about the, the early chapters of the book as you're setting the scene is listening to that, it, it, it could sound complicated. However, you make the point in the book that no is a complete answer. However, an understanding of values, what fills me up and what drains me, what else I may be committed to, allows me to make an informed choice in the moment as to whether it's the hell yes or a no, and then not to vacillate, but to stand in that truth and own it. Absolutely. And you, I was just reading a great metaphor that you put for what, what can cause us to step away from our values is the jumbotron um, <laughs> yes. spotlight that we can feel like we're under when somebody makes a request of us. So tell us more about the jumbotron approach. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I found in researching the trouble that people have when they to say no and why they often get trapped into saying yes when they actually wanted to say no is because saying no is a socially dispreferred response. When someone mm -hmm. asks you to do something, they're really expecting you to say yes. And you saying no goes against those expectations. And so we feel this 
a sense of being in the spotlight. It's called an egocentric bias in psychology, where we actually feel that everybody's eyes are on us and we have no choice but to say what the other person wants us to say. And so I use the metaphor of being on a, on a jumbotron. So, you know, we've probably watched several romantic movies where there is a romantic gesture, most often by a man, where he is proposing to a woman in front of an entire stadium of people this is displayed mm -hmm. on the jumbotron. In fact, it's big business. You pay a fair amount of money to get that uh, spotlight. And the point I make in the book is that that's very much how we feel. We have these mini stadium proposal moments in our daily lives when people ask us to do something that we don't want to do, that we want to say no to. But we feel as if we are on this big jumbotron and the whole world is watching us and we have no choice. And so one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is demystifying this, recognizing that this is a very common phenomenon. We all feel trapped and there are strategies that we can put in place to kind of feel less trapped and do what is right for us. So buying time, for example, if you're feeling in the spotlight that you feel that you are going to give an answer that you really are not committed to, it's better to buy time. It's better to ask for a little bit of time to think about it and get back to the other person. The jumbotron effect dissipates when you are not in that contentious kind of interaction with the other person. And so it's recognizing these patterns that we might fall into and kind of having systems in place. So I call these systems personal policies. Personal mm -hmm. policies are simple rules that we put together for ourselves that shape our actions and decisions. So if you're more likely to feel in the spotlight and you find that oh gosh, I'm saying yes all the time because I'm getting in this kind of mini stadium proposal moment, then you need a personal policy in place, which says, you, you know, I'm always going to ask for more time. I'm always going to have handy phrases accessible to me. Things that, you know, we can say things like, I need a little bit of time. I need to check my calendar. Let me get back to you. Things that in the spotlight, in the heat of the moment, are hard to come up with. We don't have those words. But if we, if we start practicing making this part of how we respond to things, we are able to make more informed decisions, decisions that are better for us in the long run. So playing through my mind is the scenario, you know, I'm sitting at the table with the, my boss and colleagues. The jumbotron mm -hmm. moment is when the boss turns and says, hey, Morag, can you? Yes. And of course, in that moment to my boss, it's harder to say, give me a moment. So in those scenarios, if it's a peer, that's a little it mm -hmm. feels to me it should be easier yes. um, to my direct reports. Of course, when I'm in the boss's seat, that also has a, a, a different impact. So mm -hmm. how do you say no to power? That's a really important question and one I get all the time. Now, I think it's a complicated issue and it really the answer is it depends whether you can. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's your job and this is part of your portfolio of work, you can't say no, because that's what you are being paid to do. There are also times where there's a crisis situation and you need to step up. At mm -hmm. that time, again, if there's a fire or if all the computers go down and you are the computer yes. expert, you're the one who has to kind of step up and do what's needed. But in most normal situations, given the fact that we are all knowledge workers, so to speak, and we are hired to do a job because of what we bring to the table, if we are unable to bring our best to the table, it is time for a conversation, right? One of the things I talk about in the book are many traps. And this is what I would call the house of cards trap. It's a very, very common trap for high achieving people to fall into, which is say yes to a lot of things. <laughs> and then it becomes a increasingly fragile house of cards. And then the next thing you add causes everything to fall down. 
And in my view, and in, in the research that I've done, I found that your reputation takes a greater hit if you say yes to something and you drop the ball than if you had said no in the first place. Oh, that's interesting. And that's one of the other things that really resonated for me in your book is that you do show the impact of even giving an unequivocal no and then the impact of giving a half-hearted yes. It, see, it occurs to me that the book is aimed at the receiver, how mm -hmm. to say no in a way that preserves the relationship mm -hmm. and allows everybody to leave with their egos intact. But I'm wondering what your research has shown for the other side of that equation, how the asker can mm -hmm. frame a request in a way that their needs are still met because those are important, yes. otherwise they wouldn't be asking for help, but also allows an easier rejection or a no yes. from the person to whom it's delivered. So it there's research, there's research on that. Um, that the next book. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, yeah. there, there's, a, there's a colleague of mine. Her name is also Vanessa, Vanessa Bonds. And Vanessa Bonds, who's at Cornell, did this amazing research which shows that as an asker, you have no problem at all. If you ask people to do stuff, they are more likely to say yes than no. And she, her book is basically called You Have More Influence Than You Think. Um, that that we are more prone to saying yes, and what mm -hmm. she what she, what her uh, what she's done more recently is identify ways in which we can give people an out when we ask them. So, if you ask someone for dinner and say, "Hey, would you like to go for dinner on Tuesday?" Perfectly fine if you're if you're busy. You've given them the permission to say no. I can't make it as opposed to just the question, do you want to go for dinner on Tuesday? Then it becomes much harder to say no. Mm -hmm. But if you say, do you want to go for dinner on Tuesday if you are available or if you have the time or if you want to, what she's found is giving people that out, giving them the opportunity to say no makes the conversation much easier, gets people to be able to choose or select or opt in to the things that they want to do and the things that they don't want to do. And, and very often what we as leaders need to remember is that we need to ask people what they, what aligns with their interests, what aligns with their talent and give people the opportunity to choose the tasks that align best with their talent because you're going to get the best output. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, sections that I spent some time with was um, called Feeling Powerful Versus Powerless in Our Relationships. Mm -hmm. And you were writing in the context of, wait for it, listeners, walnut trees. <laughs> now, walnut yeah. trees are a metaphor or an analogy, I realize, for toxic relationships, what I would call mm -hmm. rivals or adversaries. But what, what insights do you have for how we can feel powerful versus powerless in our relationships whether it's with a walnut tree or an adversary. Right. Uh, so the walnut tree, just to, to explain the metaphor, a walnut tree is this tall tree which has imposing canopy, deep roots that spread 50 feet out from the trunk. And it exudes into the soil a chemical called jiglone, which is a herbicide. While the walnut tree flourishes, it stems the growth of other trees in its neighborhood or in, in its vicinity. What that metaphor speaks to me about is really the, the people who will not take no for an answer. So we've, mm -hmm. let's say we've, we've kind of learned the art of empowered refusal. We've invested in developing those competencies. In most cases, they, it works perfectly fine. You speak from your identity, you invoke a personal policy, you communicate it using uh, both positive body language as well as strong, empowered verbal cues. It should work. But then there are some people who, regardless of how empowered your refusal is, it's really about them and what they want. In these cases, we need 
a very specific set of strategies to deal with walnut trees. So Vanessa, that is fascinating. And as I say, it resonates with my research around the health of our professional relationships. The walnut trees, those tough relationships that don't say no for an answer, require even more care and attention and preparation in how we can give an empowered refusal. I'm curious as to the research, to what extent is there a gender bias between those who say yes but mean no or those who feel more confident, confident in giving a no or a yes? So we definitely see a very clear gender difference in our data. All of this uh, that's in the book is research-based. It's based on peer-reviewed publications. And what we see in the data is that women have a much, much harder time saying no than men do. Uh, they feel a much stronger and much more intense spotlight. So if you're thinking about the stadium proposal moment, a woman is more likely to feel a stadium proposal moment. And these are important insights because, you know, if you are a boss pointing out to people to do this and do that, being sensitive to the fact that a woman feels that spotlight more and feels more compelled to comply to your request than a man does really puts a lot of burden on uh, the work, the female workforce. And we see that in other research as well. Women are much more likely to take on tasks that are not aligned with their skills, that have nothing to do with their jobs. We call these non-promotable tasks. So non-promotable tasks is all the office housework, all the stuff that mm -hmm. has to be done that's not anyone's job, but just needs to be done. Women are disproportionately more likely to be asked to do those tasks and significantly also more likely to take them on. And if you think about it, this, these are the tasks that are not discussed in an annual performance review. These are not tasks that you get promoted for. These are who's going to bring the coffee and donuts, who's going to take the minutes, who's going to write the next report, mm -hmm. stuff that women are disproportionately more likely to do. And, you know, when we're thinking about the empowerment and advancement of women in the workplace, which is something that's a huge priority for me in the in the role that I have at the university, uh, I think about just a simple question in your mind. Is this a promotable versus a non-promotable task before you say yes to it? Because promotable tasks are going to be stuff that you can put on your CV stuff that you can discuss with your manager in a uh, annual performance review, the stuff that you cannot, you should minimize or at least make sure that people in your team are taking turns doing it, that everyone does the non-promotable tasks, right? And so it's, so it's really important to learn to say no to non-promotable tasks. And some of that comes because, again, knowing versus to doing two different things. There's a whole chapter on getting out of our own way, that internal <laughs> talk that goes, yes, but I should or whatever that may stop us from giving that empowered refusal versus and instead of focusing on the heck yes work that you've just outlined. So, Vanessa, as we come to the end of our time together, what's the key message that you want our audience to leave with? That no is an essential skill for business success. And it is a skill that has to be practiced and learned and that you should give yourself that opportunity. Because when you say no to the, to the things that are not right for you, essentially what you're doing is you're saying yes to the things that matter. They're the things that fill you up and give you joy. And so recognizing that trade-off and making sure that you say no to the things that you truly do not want to do is going to increase your well-being and happiness and make you a much better person to work with and be around. Powerful words there, Vanessa. You've been listening to me, Morag Barrett, talk with my guest, Dr. Vanessa Patrick, about her fabulous book, and I mean that wholeheartedly, The Power of Saying No, the new science of how to say no that puts you in charge of your life. 
I encourage you to get your copy from your favorite retailer. How else can folks learn more about you, your work, and learn more about your research? I'm on LinkedIn. That's a great way to connect. Uh, my website is vanessapatrick.net. And I can be reached via my university website as well. Okay. Vanessa will make sure all of that information is included in the show notes. However, I wish to say thank you. Thank you for the insights and the nuggets that I've gleaned. There will be more little flags going into my copy as I finish your book later this week. And I look forward to future conversations. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.